Hello and welcome to the Null channel. So I know we talk a lot about Kubernetes and this is yet another Kubernetes topic. And today's topic is Kubernetes operators. So what are Kubernetes operators? And what do custom operators do and why do they matter for me and my team? And how might I make one? If these are questions you're asking yourself, stick around and we're gonna cover all of these things from start to finish. I have chapters so you can jump to where it might be interesting for you, but I warn you, this episode is long and it covers a lot of information. Don't feel bad if you watch it a few times. I, I know I probably will. Kubernetes operators and custom resource definitions, commonly shortened to CRDs, are one of the essential building blocks of Kubernetes clusters in the modern day. It enables many projects and teams to extend the Kubernetes API to have new and more powerful capabilities than originally designed. Because of this, I think it's important that all Kubernetes engineering engineers and engineering teams uh, not only understand what they are, but also understand what they are not. I'm going to one up that with an introduction into building your very own Go-based Kubernetes operator. If you'd like to see an operator built using another language or technology, uh, let me know. It would be fun to build a few more and we could even try to do it on live stream. So first, what is an operator? Let's start with the very basics. What is a Kubernetes operator? Uh, with this, it's easier to understand why they are important, how they help solve the problem, and what you can design and create on your own. A Kubernetes operator is nothing new. The, the core concept at its base was not even pioneered by Kubernetes at all, but it is the basics of how Kubernetes works. An operator in its simplest, most basic form has three parts, a controller, a state, and a resource. The controller is just some logic about how something is supposed to be managed and is usually visualized as an observe and adjust loop. Observe the current state, compare it to the desired state, and adjust the state. The state just holds information of what the desired state of the resource is, and the resource is the thing that you are managing. It is important to note here that the state should not hold reconciliation steps. It is not the job of the state to know what the state is or how it should get to that state. So a controller in Kubernetes knows how to manage the resource. It knows how to get it from one state to another. This can be an internal or external resource and just contains the logic to reconcile the current state to the desired state. Commonly, these are written in Go because of the plethora of tools, but can also be written in any language as it's just using the Kubernetes API. This state that we're talking about um, is the state that the resource is going to be kept at. And in Kubernetes is usually called the custom resource definition or CRD for short. And this can really be thought of as the API. And that's really what it is. It's a declarative API. The controller uses a state that is stored in the Kubernetes control plane or the brain of the cluster at CD to ensure that the resource is at the requested state. This state or CRD is usually described in YAML and brings declarative description and management of your resource. And the resource can literally be anything you want it to be. This could be a stateful application with specific joining or sharding requirements. It could be managing a fleet of IoT devices, or it could be a game that you created to run inside the Kubernetes cluster. In the Kubernetes world, a very good example of this would be the deployment. But Merrick, the deployment is just a resource that I apply to the cluster. Exactly. You use the API to define the desired state. That state was how many pods you want running in your cluster of a certain pod. Then the controller, or the deployment controller in this case, picks that up and works to maintain that state in the cluster. Now, this is not a custom operator. It was so useful that it was built into the base functionality of Kubernetes. So this is pretty simple, right? Yeah, really, really at its core, it's not that bad. A custom Kubernetes operator is then simply an application that defines an API for its state, stores this state in the Kubernetes control plane's brain called etcd, and uses the Kubernetes API to manage, update, and delete the desired resource. This resource can be a Kubernetes native resource, like a pod, or it can be its own entirely outside of Kubernetes resource, like a printer.
So in short, we can say that a Kubernetes operator is really just a way to extend the Kubernetes support to other resources than the built-in ones, like deployments, replica sets, and pods. And even there, we can see the pods resource manages containers, and the replica set manages pods, and the deployments manage replica sets. It's very easy to see that you could make a controller that manages deployments. Actually, this was Helm version 2. But let's be real for just a second. Why is this important? And maybe more importantly, why is it important that we can make our own? Doesn't a deployment handle everything that we need? As it's stated, it's all about extending the base of Kubernetes. There are many things that can't scale like a microservice. Deployments already handle this case extremely well. A stateful application, for example, like a database or something that provides physical access and support like a PCI device, you can think of your GPU or FPGA. All of these things require unique things outside of Kubernetes domain of knowledge. But it's okay if these are a little bit hard for you to conceptualize and why they're outside of Kubernetes. So let's make maybe what would be an easier example. Let's take a cloud provider's load balancer. This seems simple, right? We just need to create a, a pod with HAProxy or Nginx in it, right? Well, not exactly, because we will need to register to get a static IP address from our infrastructure so that our external apps and services or even users know where to access this. This will hit some service outside of Kubernetes or at least outside this Kubernetes cluster. Another thing we could want to do is provision a certificate for its communication so that if we need to manage it, we'll be able to do it securely. Or we could want to add a second load balancer and have it join as a highly available load balancer group. All of these things would require outside work, and it doesn't just scale like another pod. So all of these things, if they're not handled inside the application, need to be dealt with outside of Kubernetes by hand. Or, or you could create a custom operator that knows all of these operational needs of your application and have it do it for you. Another good example of this is an application you don't own. Like in the above example, we could have added load balancers joining into a highly available group inside the application, but only if we own the code to the application and it was a feature we wanted to add to that application. If using an off-the-shelf load balancer, we're going to have to do it their way, and it might not be possible inside of the Kubernetes deployment mechanism. This is another great example of when to use an operator, and many databases, maybe all of them, I think all of them, operate this way. The last reason to use an operator that I can think of is probably most commonly forgotten, but this is one that I quite like, uh, though I caution just using it as for all your applications as the complexity constraints are pretty high. But it can enable you to build a highly available declarative API because you use the API server and all it brings with it. This lets you leverage that API and its etcd cluster to bring you the high availability. High availability is its own topic um, of deployment. And this brings strong cons consistency to an API management plane powered by a declarative API. I caution you here as there are pitfalls to this option, but it is an interesting thought and possibly very useful thing to remember. There are some other ways uh, to do this with a stateful database with strong consistency and some microservices, but Kubernetes operators just bring all of the tools that you need to do that to the table. There are many examples of people doing this ranging from the cluster API project to OpenShift and Rancher are kind of these applications that are Kubernetes itself. The application uses Kubernetes as its core and builds an application on top of it. Uh, and they don't just use Kubernetes to schedule their pods, but they're deeply utilizing Kubernetes and its API to bring you the application as a whole. And it's pretty cool. I, I, I like it. And then at the very end of this, I have to give you my standard warning. <clears throat> An operator should be a last resort. It's not your go-to for solving your problems. You don't create an operator just because you need a microservice. I really don't think extending your Kubernetes cluster is the best way a lot of the time. Why? Well, 
For one, it requires specialized knowledge of the Kubernetes API. Both talent acquisition and complexity of your code base increase with this option, meaning it will be harder to find the right people, and you will end up with a more complicated application with two coupled code bases, one for the application and the other for the operator managing it. Not only this, but an operator will hit your etcd cluster and control plane with more requests just by its inherent nature of what it does. While I have not seen this to be a problem in small clusters or even large clusters, I can imagine a world where this impacts the control plane's performance in a negative way. If your custom operator makes a lot of right operations or is scaling very large so it ramps up its right operations uh, this could have negative impacts on your control plane now there's obviously ways around uh, making your operator in such a way it's just a warning that i want to throw out there if you utilize too much okay so how might i make one this is where it's going to get fun and we're going to break this part down into its own three parts the first part is what tools exist to help make Kubernetes operator projects and why we're going to use a project called KubeBuilder. Again, though, I'm actually going to list several other tools you can use that uh, are more dominant in other languages. Uh, then the second part is actually using KubeBuilder to scaffold a project. And the third part is implementing useful features in that project. We're not going to sit and implement every single uh, part of it. But uh, you're, the code's going to be open source, so you can go feel free to see the rest of the code. We're just going to focus on the important part. I will not only have all the code linked below, I also have a few other silly operators that I built. And you can watch the video and see the code for those as well um, if you're really interested into this Kubernetes operator thing. Okay, so how to pick the right tool for the job. This is probably one of the biggest things that separates senior engineers from junior engineers. Well, I always start with a statement of know your team. If your team only knows Python, then you're going to just want to look for a whole nother group of engineers. OK, OK, I'm joking. I'm joking. Don't all Python people get offended. So you're going to want to look for a Python based project because that's what your team knows. Or you, you could just use the Kubernetes API directly from Python as well. Although I don't really recommend this for teams new to Kubernetes operators, as it adds a lot of extra work. A happy medium might be to use something like the operator SDK that would let you use Ansible, a pretty well known tool to make your operator with. But again, there's a lot of projects out there. So know your team and pick the tool that makes the most sense for your team. All right, well now if you know Go, well, you could use the operator SDK and there's a lot of hype around it. But honestly, it seems to mostly be, if you're using Go, it really just seems to be a wrapper around KubeBuilder when making Go-based projects and really just brings a few of its own limitations. I, I would just use KubeBuilder directly if I was going to go with Go, and that's what we're going to do uh, later on in this. And KubeBuilder is what I do for all of my operators um, and on my operator teams. Uh, but again, there are projects for your language probably, uh, unless your language is Rust and then you just have the Kubernetes API. Uh, but again, you can just use the Kubernetes API. So even if you're writing this in Fortran, you can just make calls to the Kubernetes API and make your own operator. So let's list a couple major Kubernetes operators. Well, first you have the Go-based ones, KubeBuilder and the operator SDK. These are simple. But the other ones are maybe a little less. There's a Java operator SDK. So if you're big into Java, uh, you can hit that one. Then there's another project called COP. Um, and this is a Python based project that if I didn't really hate Python so much, I actually might make this my favorite operator framework that brings some pretty cool ideas to the table. And I actually really like. And then the last one we're going to talk about really quickly here is KubeRS, uh, my personal favorite as it brings the power of Rust to the Kubernetes area. And you know, I all know how much I love Rust. Um, it's one downside is that uh, it doesn't really do any operator stuff. It's just the API to Kubernetes. So it's pretty cool, but you're going to have to make your own control loops. 
But hey, you're going to be doing it in Rust, so that makes it all worth it anyways. Who needs a whole framework that does all the stuff for you when you could write it in Rust? So what does the Cube Builder framework bring? Well, I think the most important thing is that it brings the ability to scaffold the initial project. Honestly, that is all my teams use it for. After that, we just use the native Go and write the things that we need. I really like it for this and it generates all the things you need to continue writing your project. It makes a make file and gives you an initial uh, Docker file to build your containers with. And it's super useful for scaffolding. After that though, it, you really don't need to use it anymore as the rest of the stuff becomes quite simple after that scaffolding is made. So let's get Cube Builder and make an operator. All right, we're here at the computer. Let's go ahead and start scaffolding our Cube Builder project with just two easy Cube Builder commands. You might be asking, why are we starting in Git, Merrick? And the reason is, this is the easiest way to get started. The, what you wanna do is create a repo, and we're just gonna call this uh, Injector Operator. And uh, you can give it a description. It's gonna be public. And we'll give it a README, a git ignore, and we'll make this a Go template. Git ignore, and our license will be uh, the Apache 2 license, of course. So, do this in clear, create a repository. Now, once you've created this repository, everything just becomes a whole lot easier. Because as you're going to see, we need, we need a couple things from this repository. First, let's go ahead and clone it. And this is just a quick, easy git command to clone the repository. And you're going to see it's going to inject and clone it into the injector operator folder. So let's let's get into it. And we can see right here is everything that's in our repository. Uh, obviously, it doesn't list the git ignore. It's a hidden folder, hidden file. What's next? And why did we need to create a repository first? Well, first, I always believe that creating a repository first is the best way to go because it's a repository. And if you're writing some code, it should be stored in a repository, even if it's just a dumb little project for a weekend. All right. But the next thing is, we're gonna use Cube Builder to initialize our project. And Cube Builder needs to know where this is for Go. Go requires this. And so we're just gonna copy this right up here. We're gonna copy that. And now we're gonna get into Cube Builder. We want to initialize a project. So what we're gonna do, qu simple, quick, and easy. Cube Builder init. And then we need to give it in it a little bit of information. The very first thing we're going to do is our domain. So we'll do domain and we'll do null channel, All right? That, that's gonna be our, our domain. Now uh, let's give it a, uh, and you know what? We should, uh, we should go ahead and do like uh, dev.nullchannel. All right, now the next thing that we need to do is actually tell it where the repo is. Now, if you're working in your Go directory, you don't have to do this. But as you can see, I don't like working in my Go directory because I think that's one of the worst things about Go. So let's give it a repo. Repo, and this is our injector operator. That's it. Now we can hit enter. Well, okay. If you initialize it, if you spell it correctly, this is going to go off and uh, do, do a little bit of work. We're gonna, you're gonna see it pull down the controller runtime. This is what it's going to use. And it's gonna go and do a few other things. But not only that, guess what it, uh, guess what it did? Let's check out what our uh, project structure looks like. You can see it's built a bunch of things from a Docker file and a make file, but this isn't it. If, you, if you're savvy, you might notice there's no API folder. We haven't created an API yet. So, so let's go do that. That is just as easy as cube builder, create, spelling's not my strong point, create, API, and now if you remember Kubernetes, all of their APIs have a group and a version. So let's give it a group, group. Uh, let's see, our group is going to be injector because that's what we're making. And then our version, let's give it a version, is gonna be a V1 uh, alpha one. It's a good place to start right at the beginning. And then the very last one is its kind. So this is group, version, and kind. These are all gonna start making more sense as you understand Kubernetes. These are straight from your standard Kubernetes thing. So let's give it a kind. And our kind is going to be of injector. I said cube build again, again, it's cube builder. Now, here's a really important thing. It doesn't have to create all the resources for you. 
But if this is your first time creating a, an operator, you wanna go ahead and hit yes here and yes to create the controller as well. These are gonna create some components for you that are very nice and easy to use. You have an operator. Let's check it out. Here we have our APIs folder, our bin, our config controllers, and everything we need to build it. So let's check it out in Visual Studio Code. Here's our project. This is everything that Builder made for us. And it was pretty easy. Check it out. We have our API, which has our group version info in here. As you can see, it's the injector.dev.null channel. And our version is v1 alpha 1. And it scaffolded all of this out for us. Then we have our basic types. This is our custom resource definition. Our injector spec here. We can add something new here if we want. We'll get into that later. You can see our struct is here. This is the actual injector with our type meta and object meta and our spec and status. This is really cool. All of this was created for it. Your bin just contains the controller gen with the version that it's at. Config here actually has a bunch of uh, different things for your project and is where all of your configuration of your operator lives. And then here's one of the most important parts. It made our first controller for us, our injector controller. We're gonna get into updating that later, but for right now, understand this is where all of the reconciliation logic happens and it, it's right here. This is where the magic happens. Basic hack folder for any of your basic hack scripts that you're gonna wanna keep. And then yeah, everything else is here. We got a Docker file that's already ready to build. This will build your controller and run your controller. It's pretty sweet. Um, all your gold go mod and everything and your main uh, entry point is right here. This entry point was not even only just scaffold with the basics, but it was also added your controller. So now your controller will be running your custom controller. Okay, Merrick, you've just pointed out a bunch of random, uh, random stuff, but we wanna know how to update and what's really important. and. Furthermore, I want to tell you what parts of this are important and how to get you off of working on your own operator. Because I know a lot of what I've told you is just maybe a little daunting. So let's start covering the basics. Let's do some basic working with the Kubernetes API. And then let's get into a few more advanced topics like finalizers and how to watch other objects like Let's say you wanted to watch pods. This way, you're gonna have a, a toolkit that you can use and start to expand on. So let's get started. So the first thing that we're gonna wanna do here is we're gonna wanna look at how all of this starts. Now, here is your main function. This is your main entry point into your controller. All right, well, let's check it out. Let's see what it does. The first thing I wanna point out here is this new manager. This is pretty much what Builder is bringing, and this is the controller manager here. And these are the options that you can use to configure it. I'm not gonna go over every option, but I'm gonna go over some of the most important, but just understand this is how you configure it. This is the schema, uh, the mapper provider, but more importantly, if you have a custom logging that you wanna do, this is where you pass in your logger. If you have a custom sync period, that's where you pass in your custom sync period. And this is also where you can set up leader election, lots of things to do with leader election, um, as, as well as just how, how long of a retried period, as well as do you want this to run in a namespace? If you wanna namespace it, this is where you do it. All you have to do is pass things in right here, just like this. As you can see, we're passing in our scheme. This is our new scheme right here. Pretty cool, okay. So that's setting it add up, but we wanna add a controller. Well, that's already done for us, so you get to see it right here. First, we're creating a new injector reconciler. This is going to be the thing that reconciles our resources. And as you can see, we're passing the Kubernetes client, that's what's right here, and our scheme. So let's go check out what setup manager with manager looks like. This is our setup with manager. You can see that it's actually in this controllers injector controller. And what it's doing here is telling you what type of custom resource definition to watch for this controller. So this controller is watching the injector resource. That means every single time that this uh, resource gets created or updated, this controller is going to be notified. But how is it notified? Well, it's notified right here in the reconcile uh, function. So this is what gets called whenever a change get, gets happened. And you'll notice right here at the very top, we have this request. 
This is really important. This request here holds a namespace name. That's all it has. Let's check it out. Just don't take my word for it. This is it, a namespace name, which has a namespace and a name. As we know, all resources in Kubernetes are unique per their namespace and name. So let's use this. How do we use the Kubernetes API? Well, as we can see up here, our injector reconciler has the client. So we can use the Kubernetes client on this R. So let's do R. And you know what? I generally like to actually type out client just so that people understand that I'm using the client here, the Kubernetes client. And we, need, we now need to get our resource. We need to get the thing that got changed. We don't know what it is. So let's go ahead and get it. So let's do a git request. And this takes a context. So we're just going to pass in the context here. And we can see that it takes an object key. Well, we have an object key in that request, that namespace name. And now we need an object. Why is this? It's because you're passing in a pointer to it. And we're passing in a pointer to our injector object. It needs an injector. Let's, let's get one for it. So we'll do var injector. Um, and this is going to be a v1 beta1 injector. Um, and now we can pass that in here. Now it's expecting a pointer. That's where the deep clone is. So let's uh, make this a pointer injector. All right, cool. So now we've just used the Kubernetes API and got this injector resource. This is how all you have to do to use the Kubernetes API. Then uh, we can check it out. See, this retrieves an object from for the given object key from the Kubernetes cluster. The cluster, this is being stored in the etcd cluster, the Kubernetes back the backing brain, the memory to the cluster. This isn't all it has. You can also list all the resources. So basically, this gives you an object list for it. Well, let's look at what that might look like. Instead of a, a single object like this, it needs a list. So let's get one of those. Injector list. And that's a v1 alpha1 injector list. You can see that this is building out everything for us. That's pretty cool. And we can just use it like that. You can also pass object uh, options here. So as you can see, there's options that are allowed to be passed in. And here you can filter by namespace and a bunch of other things that will be really helpful. And that's pretty cool. And now we have a list of, of injectors. And we can use this at list. We can iterate over it. So now you can see v dot. Uh, and this is, has all the information of our operator. That's pretty cool, right? So this is our custom resource right here, and we're listing all the ones in the cluster. But what else can the Kubernetes API can do? Well, it can do pretty much everything you would expect from a CRUD API. We can list, we can get, we can patch, we can delete, update, everything you want to know. Let's talk a few about a few of these. Patch and update. You might ask, what's the difference between them? Patch allows you just to send a partial update up to the server. And with that patch, it's going to have a merge and whatnot. So really, patch is a little bit more advanced because you have to understand how it's going to, to patch the, research, the resource on the server. And then update is just going to take that entire object and update it on the server. And then you can delete. You can delete all of and uh, some of those basic operations. So this is, this is the entire Kubernetes API. Now that that's out of the way, and we've done that, Let's talk about some other things. All right, so if you wanted to set this up to watch another resource that's not your resource, you can do that. It's not that hard. So here in the setup with manager is where that magic is going to happen. And what we need to do is we need to set this up and tell it that it watches something. So we're going to do that right now. Watches, just like that, done. But it's, it's not, that quite, not quite that easy. First, we're going to have to tell it what we want to watch. So let's watch a pod. Um, if we're going to watch a pod, we're going to do source.kind. And in this, we're going to give it a type. Type of, this is going to be core v1.pod. That's it. That's not it. That's absolutely not it. I, I lied. I lied because we have to do one other thing. We have to tell it some way to map this pod back to our, our injector. So let's do that. We'll do uh, something like uh, handler dot in q in q uh, no 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 not that one in q requests from map all right so what this is going to do here 
is it's basically just going to map it. Now there's a couple different ones here. As you can see, there, there are plenty of ones to choose from. This is the one that I'm going to use here. And all we're going to do is map a pod back to our object. So we'll do r dot get all or r yeah, got get all. And all we're going to do is map any pod back to all of our operators. Okay, let's let let's do that. Um, we need to now make this function, and this get all function is going to take a client, and it's going to return a slice of requests. So basically, what this is saying here, if you wanted to break it down, is that for every single pod, our injector. All of our custom resources. So if we had three different injectors in there, each one would run um, if a new pod was created or if a pod was updated. So this is probably a horrible thing to do in this way. But this is a way that you could watch pods and you could manage pods. Um, and in this, it doesn't have to return for all of them. It could return for just ones that are labeled with your label. And that's actually what we did in the injector that we made on live stream. So if you want to see that injector, uh, check out the live stream and then go check out uh, this open source project. And you can see what it what was done there. And so really, you can just return as many uh, requests for this injector. And that's what you would, would do here. You could also just return one. You could have this map back to a single instance. All right, so now we're pretty familiar with how to use the client API for Kubernetes. Not only that though, we're also pretty familiar with how to watch other resources from pods to deployments. You can even watch other custom resources. That's how powerful it is. You can do all of that now, but we're not quite done. I don't want you to feel overwhelmed. Feel free to come back and watch this video as many times as you need, but I want to cover a few other topics. Now, it's very plausible that your custom resource operator and your, your operator will manage other uh, other resources. And in the case that your custom resource definition gets deleted, you might want to go and clean up those. So let's say you made a custom resource for a database. When that custom resource was removed, you would want to go and delete all of the database. So this is where finalizers come in and we're going to learn to create one. It's actually quite easy. So let's jump into it. Here we are in Reconcile. You'll notice that we're going to get our injector just like we did. Now, I added a little bit of extra code here, basically just checking to make sure that we catch the error. But now we're going to jump into the finalizer. First, all finalizers have a name. So here's my finalizer's name. Now, this is where it starts to get fun. The first thing you do on this loop is check to see if the deletion timestamp is zero. If it is zero, it means that it's not being deleted. If it's not zero, if it's non-zero, it means your resource is actively being deleted. So we're checking if it's getting deleted. It's not getting deleted. Well, cool. We're going to check if it has our finalizer name in its finalizers. If it doesn't have our finalizer, we're going to add it. It needs to have our finalizers to make sure that it gets cleaned up properly. And if it does contain our finalizer, then we're done. We don't need to do anything more. All right, but what if its time its timestamp is non-zero? This is where it gets even more interesting. It's non-zero. It's getting deleted. Now we check to see if it contains the string of our finalizer name. We want to make sure our finalizer is on this object because if it's not, then we don't want to clean it up. If it is, we run this function. This function can do whatever we need to do to have it delete and clean up our custom resource definition. I don't have any logic in there right now. Once that's done and once it works, we'll remove it. You'll notice here that if it fails, we return. And basically what we do is we do another reconciliation loop and we keep doing that until we're able to clean it up. Once this succeeds and we get no error, then we remove the finalizer and we allow Kubernetes to finally delete the custom resource definition. So if you have a stuck finalizer, something is, is failing in this loop. And then we can, oh, well, I have, duplicate return here, then you can move on to your logic and your logic sits right here. However, you're reconciling this object. We now have a finalizer and we can clean up our resources. What is it? Why are you bothering me? I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of a game. Oh, so.
So you think that I need, you want me to show you how to actually test and run your custom operator? All right, that's so simple. We can just do it right here, right now. Thankfully, I have my laptop right here beside me. Never game without it. All right, so you wanna test your operator locally. You know what? There's basically two parts to this. First, you're gonna need a local cluster. You can either use Kind or any other local cluster technology that you want, like Docker Desktop. All right, so I'm gonna use Kind. Kind create cluster. This is gonna take just a few seconds and I'm gonna have a local Kubernetes cluster to test with. Super cool. All right, so the next thing that we're gonna need after we have a local Kubernetes cluster is we are going to need to install our manifests. Now, the great thing about KubeBuilder and what it does for us is it made that make file. So all we have to do is use that make file. Let's do that now. So we can do make install. And you're gonna see this just applied our our custom resource definition. The only thing left is to run it. Make run. And all your log messages and any output is going to output right to this terminal and allows you to test your operator locally here in Kubernetes. Now you can go ahead and apply your custom resource definition and you'll see all the logs of it running the reconciliation loop. Awesome, that's all there is to it. Now I'm gonna get back to gaming. Oh, come on! Does that have you excited to make your own operator? If this helped you in any way, please go ahead and leave me a comment and let me know. Do you work on operators yourself? I'd love it if you listed them in the comments and let me know where you contributed. Did, you, did this inspire you to build your own silly or stupid or fun operator? Let me know. I'd love to check them out and uh, see what you guys did. All right, that is it uh, for today. That's the basics of uh, Kubernetes operators, and there's a whole lot more. And if you want me to do more videos on this, make sure you like and subscribe and thumbs up and share this video. Um, it really encourages me to keep making them. So if you like this video and want to see more on operators, let me know, and we'll make more on operators. If you'd like me to make other ones, let me know, and I'll make other types of videos. But that's it for me today. If you like this video, please go ahead and like and subscribe. If you did not like this video, for the sake of science, for the sake of everyone out there watching and for future generations, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, stick around, and see if these videos get any better for science.